Thank you. Well, for those who sit on the fence too long, it can become painful. So perhaps that's one of the lessons in <laughs> CSR experience. But Ashok, if I can come back and if I can just ask Nick Nuttall, I need a note on how much time we still have because we start a little bit later. So Nick, if you could bring me up a note. Ashok, you have this wonderful gift of working at the point of reality and at the same time being somebody who also in your capacity at the Club of Rome now thinks almost in generational terms. When we talk about the green economy, I think this is a very important set of pointers to business also. Take a 10-year horizon. What are the three, if I can just pick three out, and I'm sure there are many more, but perhaps what are the three most likely changes, shifts, or political developments, or whatever may be disruptive or constructive, that will make the green economy transition more likely? And you, you look, in a sense, at that broader picture, can you perhaps just pull three out that are most on your mind at the moment, perhaps? Well, I think um, the bottom of the pyramid, the, the three billion who got excluded over the last uh, 60 years of so-called international development, uh, are not a moral issue only. They're not an ethical issue that they have a right as human beings to have better lives. They are also a practical issue for business. They are not a market at the moment. And until they're seen as potential markets, uh, we will not be able to bring uh, about a global economy that can be green. Because the poor, just like the rich, are quite destructive of the environment, different parts of the environment. The rich go for the non-renewables, the fossil fuels, the metals, the minerals. But the poor, just to survive, have to destroy their forests and their soils and their waters, and everyone suffers from both. So, Poverty is a green issue. We cannot come here and talk about environment unless we recognize that it is because of poverty as much as because of affluence that we are suffering from these two cancers, uh, povertitis as well as affluenza, which are essentially terminal diseases, both of them. And we got both at the same time. So one thing that has to change is that Business has to see these as a market. But it can't because they don't have the purchasing power. So the next thing that has to change is to transform one's thinking about technology and production systems. Not just consumption, but production systems so that you decentralize them in such a way that the local economy can start generating money. In other words, unless we decentralize our production systems to an extent where every person has a job and can earn money, because that's how we create wealth in this society, and we'll continue to for a while, uh, we can't do that. So that's the second thing. That first is recognize that there is a huge potential market, which is not just an obligation, but an opportunity. Second, decentralize and make it possible. And the third is the choices of technology. Technologies that we will be talking about a lot at these two sessions today and tomorrow, what we call the blue economy the um, technologies that are based on uh, being compatible with the uh, limits of nature, uh, in fact, inspired by nature. Uh, these are the kinds of technologies that you will be hearing a lot about because we're launching a book on the subject here, which essentially make it possible for you to get all that you want and a good life without destroying Mother Earth. Let me ask you, is that the answer then to perhaps the question, well, it's all very well to talk about the three, three and a half billion, in a sense, at the bottom of the pyramid, but the history of the 20th century is that uh, for every million that moves out of poverty, the footprint escalates to five or tenfold. So how do you reconcile the notion that, yes, the poor first initially strive for a very resource-efficient economy and the utilization of resources, but then in their progression, if they become part of the other three and a half billion people, that could be a great escalation of our footprint. Where is the answer? Or no, where do we look for an answer? No, the, the devil, uh, Achim, is in the detail. Uh, here, what you said is a sleight of hand. It's not quite correct. When you move from being just below the poverty line to just above the poverty line, your footprint doesn't increase by a factor of five. Your footprint increases by a factor of five because of the extreme affluence that you end up with uh, which demands uh, uses of resources which are of an extreme nature. Uh, this includes jet travel, but it includes the kinds of power and electricity and energy use and water use and, 
and all the demands that we place on nature through the way we construct our buildings, the way we construct our infra infrastructure and so on. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just a basic, decent uh, level of living. And to go from where people are today to a decent level of living does not increase the uh, environmental footprint. It may actually decrease it because of the destruction I was talking about earlier. Uh, but in any case, if you have a simple-minded view about this year, I've raised 1% of the, of the um, economy above the poverty line, uh, and therefore my footprint's gone, you're obviously going to get the wrong answer. You have to look at time horizons like 2050 or 2100, and by that time, what I was talking about earlier, the demographic transition makes up hugely for the, the footprint. So if you have two billion fewer people in 2050, which is entirely possible, uh, you will have a far smaller footprint, even though everybody's living better. Thank you. Angelina, let me ask you for a moment Renewable energy, one of the, let's say, best examples of a transition towards a green economy. How feasible is it going to be to envisage renewable energy not as the niche provider, not in a 200-year horizon, but literally in a three-decade horizon? Let's put it there for a moment. 2040, 2050. What is going to make renewable energy the single largest provider of energy on the planet, as opposed to losing a competition against extended fossil fuel use, nuclear energy as a transition technology, or business as usual? Renewable energy is probably going to be the solution for all of us. And I would like to take up from what Ashoka just mentioned here. The people who live in poverty right now, if we need to bring up their living standards, they don't have to repeat the mistakes that we made. They don't have to incorporate the fossil economy that we have as a developed nations taken to an extreme. They can certainly take what I like to say an example of going wireless and going distributed as opposed to having to reinvent the phone line. The president of the Maldives made a very important note today. He said, we didn't move away from the Stone Age because stones disappeared, they just became obsolete. What we're seeing now in industry is that a lot of this current paradigm that we have in the energy sector, the traditional energy sector, is becoming obsolete more and more. We're seeing smarter systems, we're seeing better systems, we're seeing distributed energy becoming as a solution. So you can take a society like villages in India and you can electrify them very quickly with microgrids. You can bring education, you can bring industry, you can bring jobs to people. You can bring solutions almost instantaneous. The 20th century can come there tomorrow. You cannot do that with the traditional systems we developed in the developing nations in terms of building central power stations, in terms of building a grid that is very expensive in terms of hooking up everybody to energy. No, they can go wireless and they can very quickly become independent. Another solution to the poverty, and again, an incentive for industry, is the fact that these markets are now fertile that they can be the markets that incorporate these technologies, but we have to be smart about how we do it. We can't expect the poorest people to pay for 20 years' worth of electricity up front. Even the wealthy nations can't do it. And right now, what you see in Kenya, what you see in Africa, what you see in many nations is we're expecting these people to pay for a solar system up front, and these are the poorest people in the country. Meanwhile, if we had smart financing systems, it would be cheaper for them than using kerosene or wood, which is much more destructive and much more endangering to the environment and increases the carbon footprint. 